What is going on guys? My name is Chris. I go by Vox Damon everywhere on every social media platform. And if you've seen laser shows like this or this, it's probably me designing them. Today, what I want to do is teach you guys how to design your own laser shows using Quick Show. There's a lot of resources out there for you to figure it out on your own, but you do have to kind of like pick from different places and put it all together. It's not a super difficult thing to do, but you do need to understand the hierarchy of certain elements and just all the tools that are available to you to use. This tutorial is gonna assume two things. One, you already have a laser from tinydeskgraves.com. And two, you already have QuickShow set up and working. So that means that your projector is outputting, all the settings are working fine. If you don't have either of these two assumptions checked off, um, you can go ahead and download the demo for QuickShow. I'll include it in the description for this video so you can follow along if you're interested in seeing how you feel about the program before actually committing. Uh, with the demo, you just can't save or output to a laser, but you could still take advantage of everything that's being taught right here. And there's a lot going on in Quick Timeline. All right, let's get into it. All right, here we are in QuickShow. We have a clean workspace and clean timeline down here. The first thing we need to go over is what is a queue. So a queue is gonna be the content that we output to the laser. This workspace right here has a bunch of slots and each one of them can hold a queue. And usually you trigger these live through um, either a MIDI device or you can even use your keyboard. For our purposes, for creating shows, um, I'll show you exactly how we can integrate the workspace queues with the timeline. It's actually pretty cool. So to create a queue, all we gotta do is right click on one of these spaces, go to create, and you get the queue types over here. But for our purposes, we're going to be talking mostly about shape. And we also use a parametric image for beams, like single point beams. Okay, so this is the shape editor. Uh, you can see that we have a row up here of pre-built shapes. So all these ones already have parameters filled out that are pretty similar. Most of them are like size 50. Um, and they're very useful. Usually when I go in here, I don't change too much. The most important settings on this page are these two right here and these two right here. Uh, so this one represents line mode. And what line mode will do is it will give you a very smooth shape. There won't be any hot spots on the queue. What I mean by that is if we projected this on a wall, it would just be an actual complete circle. Now, if we wanted to add points on that circle, um, what we would do is switch it into beam mode. Now, beam mode gives us all these little points to work with and Usually you want to keep this point count kind of low. If the spec of the queue is a little too much for your projector to handle, then you're going to get uh, like a strobing effect, which is just the scanner struggling to keep uh, the points per second high. Uh, so you can reduce the amount of points with the slider right here. You can go all the way down to like five points. Now it creates like a pentagon. Now there's two things we need to think, think about when we're in beam mode. There is the points and there's also the points per beam. Points will show us these guys right here. So it's like a visual, how many points are part of this shape where points per beam actually increases the strength of each point. Um, so if we only have 10 points per beam, these guys are gonna be pretty dim, I would say. It's, Usually um, five through 10 is relatively dim. I would try to keep these a little bit higher, um, maybe 30. Uh, what I found is that um, I try to keep the total amount of points displayed at a single time under 300 for the best results. So what we would do here to figure that out is multiply. We have five points, we have 30 points per beam. So five times 30, we have 150 points total. So we actually have some headroom with this queue. Um, we can either add another queue on top of it in the timeline to be displaying at the same time. That would be perfectly fine. Or we can just increase the power of this queue if it's going to be projecting by itself and you can get a really nice bright queue. Now let's say we liked how it kind of looked in line mode where it was all connected, but we do want these points 
to be highlighted. What we'd have to do is go into B mode and now this subset of options shows up and we'll go to connect beams. And just like that, it, it looks the same on the preview, but when we put it on the laser, I'll, I'll probably show a preview somewhere here. Then you'll see that those points are now like little hot spots, which can be great for designing, depending on like what kind of feel you're trying to give the show. Now, another parameter we control here is beam speed. And what that'll do is it will have the points rotate or possibly travel off, depending on what cue you're using. Um, for this one, it'll be rotation. So here, slide it a little bit. Now we're rotating. Um, and this rotation is based on time. If we look over here in this corner, we see a little clock. If we want it to be based on beats, we click it and now it's beat based. This cue will read the beats that are, or the BPM of uh, your timeline show and it will correspond. I think it's better to illustrate beam speed with a line. It's gonna make a little bit more sense because the other one could be, that rotation can be acquired a number of different ways. Um, with a line, this is, I think this is pretty unique. So let's move this a little bit and we can see they're traveling, disappear, reappear over here, traveling, traveling, traveling. This can create an undesirable effect because now you have like a stuttering in the visual. Uh, depending on the show, maybe you don't want that. And if you don't, you can make this a little bit smoother by adding these endpoints. So show static corners up here. When we add that, now the tips of this cue are always visible. So there's like clearly divine, defined, clearly defined boundaries for where this shape exists. Um, and that can be really nice sometimes. You can be like, you can stretch it out and that whole thing is moving still or you can like extend one side and it looks like you're, I don't know, there's a lot of creative ways to use that. Um, and then we can also obviously change the color of our cue itself. You know, turn this line mode on so you can see. Um, the other thing about using line mode, or if you're connecting the beams or using line mode, you can't really see uh, the beam speed um, too well. So I would recommend turning those off while you're trying to figure out like what speed you want to be using. And then when you're actually ready to use your cue, we can turn that back on. There's this area right here where we can add effects. And if we wanted to add even more effects, we could use this tab right here and uh, effects layer. And I'll go over that in a little bit, but um, it is, it is kind of nice to have these two, two areas. And then when we're all done with our cue, say we're set, actually I'm gonna make this size 100. I usually make all of my cues size 100. So when I drag them into the timeline, I always know I'm starting with the maximum area possible. I just wanna make it cyan, like cyan. And hit okay. And then now our cue is saved into the workspace. All right, now that we have a cue, we can talk a little bit more about the timeline. So the timeline is here, I'm gonna stretch this up a little bit, have a little more space. Um, so the timeline is where all of our shows are gonna be created. Um, you can see that we have a grid here that by default usually represents time, um, but we can change that to represent beats. And I'll show you how to do that in a second. Um, let's just go over the icons around the timeline real quick. Okay, so we have our menu button right here that has all the options we can use to modify our timeline. Uh, we have this icon right here, which will open up a show. This one will save the show. Uh, this is, these are two different modes that you can put your pointer into. Um, so select event versus draw event. We're gonna come back to that. Here we can play the show, pause the show. This has to do with the beat, uh, the snapping to the grid. So this is no snapping, medium strength snapping, strong sap snapping. Show you that one with a soft magnet. You can drag the playhead. It'd still go through, but it will snap when we get close. Strong one will instantly snap. I usually keep it on this one just for variety. This one will allow you to analyze and zoom in on an event. I don't really use this at all. Set marks by event, I don't use this either. Set marks in and out. This is really important for creating loops. If you were trying to listen to a part of the song, you wanna know like, what does this one feel like? You wanna be able to play it over and over and over again. Uh, what you would do is set your end point and then set your out point. And now 
if we hit play, you hit play with spacebar or you can use this guy right here. And just repeat. Super useful, super duper useful. Um, and if you wanted to modify the in and out, we can get really close to this area. Once that icon pops up, we can drag. And this also follows the same snapping strength that you've set earlier. So do that, that. Now we're going for a wider loop. So that's really nice. Um, if you wanna get rid of this, what you do is you right click in the yellow area and you get this sub menu right here and we'll do clear user time. You can also use this to create in and out points if you'd like to. But yeah, so clear user time and now we don't need to deal with that anymore. Okay, and this one is to set your audio file. Uh, we can actually go ahead and do that. I have one prepared. So we're gonna take this guy, just click on your audio file. This works best with, with WAV files. So I have an MP3, but I've had problems with MP3 where the song itself, like the waveform will stretch if I zoom in and out. And the actual points where the song will play actually change. Um, so if you can grab wave files whenever you have to work on something. Uh, so let's open this. Okay, now we can see the waveform on the timeline. Uh, if we want to expand it, we can use this icon right here. It gets a little bit larger. What you may have noticed here is that these beats right here, beat, beat, oh yeah, beat, beat, beat. Um, these are not lining up to anything on the grid. And that's because we haven't set that yet. So let me show you how to do that. Uh, what we gotta do is go to menu, go to show properties, and currently time is measured in seconds, which we actually don't want. Um, for EDM music anyway, it's really nice to be, actually probably all music. It's nice to be able to see things in, um, in beats. So we're gonna switch that to BPM and then type in the BPM of our song. And also make sure these are unchecked. You don't need it. If anything, you could use no output at start time actually. That could be useful. Don't use follow system BPM though, because that will screw up everything. Um, your system BPM is right here. Um, and that's probably not gonna be in line with what your timeline requires. So don't worry about those. We hit okay. And now the grid has changed. So we have two indicators. This top one is going to be the grid in time. And this bottom one is the grid in beats. So if we zoom in real close, we can see that we now have our beats lined up nicely. And if they're not lined up really well, you might have a file where maybe music starts a little bit later or you know anything could happen all you got to do is grab and move it around um currently it's going to be snapping so maybe turn off snapping if it's that far off we go like here and then we can just drag it exactly where it needs to be and then once you have it where you need to be uh just right click and go ahead and lock event position so that way you don't accidentally lose this very precise spot that you've created. So I've had that happen before a couple of times, super easy fix though. But for this one, everything's looking good. So we'll just drag that back and then I will lock that in place. Okay, we went kind of deep into that icon. So let's finish the icons. Um, so this is publishing to the Pangolin cloud. Uh, Pangolin has a service where you can download um, shows that other people have put up in their cloud service and you can play them on your own. Uh, they won't have sound, but it's a pretty cool idea. I really like that idea. Other icons we have here, we have show it now right over the preview window. If you click show it now, what this will do is allow you to output the content that you created in your timeline. Even if you have enabled your laser, your show on the timeline will not appear unless you hit show it now, super important. Couple other icons down here, we have the magnifying icon. So if you wanna zoom in, this zooms in on wherever you have the playhead. So zoom in, zoom out. Um, this will give us a full view of our entire timeline. And if for whatever reason you need even more space than uh, what you have, you can hit this arrow right here and it will extend the show a little bit. Um, I also wanted to talk about this scrolling bar. So if you want to scroll in a more relative manner, 
you can left click on it and scroll and see it's not like scrolling one to one if you want it to scroll one to one all you got to do is right click on it and then we can quickly scroll throughout our entire project okay let's move on to the content of the timeline so let's let's go into the timeline um what we see right here are our tracks um, we have the audio track and then we have these other tracks that are going to be used to hold events and also effects if we want to add more tracks we can right click in this area and click add laser track or you want it to add um, like a media track you can do that too um, if you want to put an effect line which i will talk about later we do add effect line and there we have a little effect line which only affects this track uh, so those two are linked you don't need to worry about it cascading down all of your tracks um that's weird i have never done that actually add laser track with random events i've never done that let's do that okay nothing happens all right well i've never used it before okay Okay, going deeper into these tracks, if we right click on a track, we get add laser track, add effect line, we've had these, and then track properties. I use it to organize my destination. So if you have multiple lasers, um, it's, it's nice to have one track dedicated to one laser or possibly two lasers that are mirroring each other or something like that. So it makes designing a little bit quicker. So what we would do for a different destination we go to projection zones and we may have all of our zones here i don't but if we had more zones what we do is we just use this button to add it to our tracks output zones it's pretty easy if we want to put it back we just put it right there back forth back forth um say we want to use this same destination for the next track below also just to save some time instead of doing the same process, what we could do is um, use this button right here. So this is going to assign to one track below. It's important, I believe this happens in Quick Show. I know it happens in Beyond, but if you type in a number, so say we want to do to the next two tracks, and you hit, if you hit enter, there's gonna be an error where it waits for a very long time. Something happens, I don't know, I don't know why that happens. But just don't hit enter, just don't hit enter. Um, just hit assign to number tracks below. Hit that and confirm and okay. So we see here underneath that everything in track one, two, and three is gonna go to our main graphics zone. And now if you don't have multiple zones, then you don't need to worry about this. I figure eventually you probably will. So it's, it's good to know. Okay, now we can talk about events. I've been saying events over and over again without really showing you what they are. Put simply, they are just containers that hold queues. Uh, let me show you what I mean by that. Create an event, there are a couple ways to do it. I mentioned these icons above here. Um, if we're in pointer mode, what we can do is just right click and hit create event. And this creates an empty event right here where we have the option to now create a queue inside of that event. So we'll create a shape. Um, if you want to set this to some default parameter, because there is a default parameter, um, just right click on the slider. So we go to 100, um, points is 200. If we right click, it goes to 300. I usually keep this a little bit lower. We'll do 100, okay. So now we can actually see, I'm gonna zoom in using the scroll wheel. Now we can see that we have our event and we also see a little preview of the queue that's inside of the event uh, let's make this snap there we go so we have this lined up and we can see in our preview window um, this is what the queue is going to look like uh, you won't actually see all these lines i think it just uses those to represent the 3d image yeah so now we have an event yeah so like i said an event is a container for a queue you can see that if we go over here to our effects tab. So now if we click our effects tab, let me drag this down a little bit so you can see all the effects. These are the default effects. All these effects show up every time that we create an event. And that's incredibly useful because these are very common things that we change all the time, like size, rotation, position. 
Uh, color, I don't use too often. I use a different version of color. Um, Cause these are all key effects. There are three different types and we're gonna go over that also. Okay, so that's how you create an event with a right click. There's a couple other ways to create events. So if we have the pointer mode, uh, we could also just double click uh, wherever you want the event to start. So double click and hold. So it's one, two, hold, and we can drag the event out to where we want it to stop. And then when you release, you get this menu again, you can create your queue that's gonna be inside of the event. The other way you could do it, and I don't do this, I mean, you can draw an event. So now you have this pencil, or instead of double clicking, you can just click and hold and then draw it. I find that the pointer is a little bit more versatile. So I just, I just stick with the pointer. There is a red little handle in this corner and there is a green handle in this corner. Bring the cursor close enough, you get a little mark that came up. That means you can click and hold on a fade. It's like a, this would be like an outro fade. The other one would be like an intro fade. So click, now we have the handle, we can drag and just release whenever we're satisfied with that position. So this means that we're gonna start at 100% brightness. We're gonna go, 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 go. And then once we hit here, 100 is gonna fade in a linear manner till we hit zero. Here, let me open up this preview window a bit and then you can see what I'm talking about. And fading to zero, bam, good. Same thing with the front one, you can grab it over here. So now we have an intro fade. Ooh, there it is. And there it goes. Um, Cause there's another way to do fading that's a little bit more effective, a little bit more exact. Um, here, I'll show you right now. There's an effect called brightness. So we just click on brightness. Um, we get this little timeline, 0% signals the beginning of our event, 100% signals the end. You could see how the play had moved when I clicked on this timeline. See it jumping around? Yeah. You can also grab the playhead on the timeline and move it in that little version of the event. Um, that's very important when you wanna like fade on a specific beat. So if you've used Adobe software, keyframing is very familiar to you and this is gonna be super easy because it's the same or it's very similar. So what we do is we hit create key. Oop creates a key right there, and we can adjust the value at that key. So maybe we want brightness to be 100, that's fine. And then we want to end at zero. So we'll just drag this slider, and then if we play our event back, see, fades. Good. Uh, you could also see on the timeline, it added these little notches right here, and one right here, where we have effects that have keyframes. If you wanna expand all the effects that you have for this event, we can click this little icon right here. It does the same thing as our audio one where it expands it a little bit. And now you can actually click and hold on these guys if you want to move this while looking at your timeline. Uh, Beyond has a couple more options when you right click on these guys, like you can change um, the way that it fades. So instead of having to do a linear fade, you can actually do like something with like an accelerating curve. So an accelerating curve would be here and then boom. Or you can do something with like deceleration. Um, there's a bunch of, you can even do custom waveforms, uh, which I use very often. That's how I get shows really dialed in. In Quick Show, you can't do that and that's okay. You don't, you don't need that right now. Okay, since we're here, we should probably talk about effects. Okay, like I said earlier, there are three different types of effects in Quick Show. Uh, we can look into them by going right here. We hit add, we have oscillating effects, we have key effects, and we have color effects. I'm gonna try to go over them kind of quickly, but give you an idea of what's going on. So an oscillating effect is when we wanna have a repetitive action. So say we have a beat where it's like bump, 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 bump. And we want the cue that we've created to go bump, 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 back and forth, back and forth as it hits the beat. Um, so what we do is use an oscillating effect because it's oscillating. It's doing the same thing, it's over and over again. So let me show you how to do that. Um, I am going to create a shape that we can actually see a little bit better. So we have a beam right here. It is at zero, zero in the grid. Right now we're looking at a laser that's projecting upwards. I've set this earlier. 
I don't want to get into that, but I, I said it earlier, okay? So that's that's zero zero on the grid. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have to go bang, bang, bang on the beat. So what we would do is we're gonna add an effect. We know this is oscillating because it's repeating itself. This is a geometric effect because we're affecting its position. And in order to do that, going back and forth, we're working in the X dimension. Sorry, we're working on the X axis. I don't even know if the dimension's okay. It might be okay, but we're working on the X axis. We're gonna go to position of X because that's what we're gonna be modifying. We have these radio buttons right here. If we click this one, we're going to be um, oscillating based on the beat. If we do this one, we're oscillating based on the beginning and the end of the event. Um, as you're designing, both of those will be important. You'll, you'll, you'll realize it when you need it. I promise, I promise. So for now, we're going to be doing clock and beat mode. We're gonna go start at negative 100. So that's, we're working in the X axis. So X is negative 100, and then we're gonna go to 100. Uh, what we can do is we can just click on this button and it has a bunch of predefined options, which is really helpful if you wanna just do things quickly. Yeah, so we're just gonna go negative 100 to 100. And this is clock beat mode. We can take a look at our options right here. And this has to do with the behavior um, so what I was talking about before, where we were able to accelerate, um, decelerate, those are all here. You guys can experiment with this one. Uh, you just need to change the option and play it through. You can see the difference. Um, I know what we need right now is going to be ping pong because I want to go back and forth, back and forth. Linear would be, it'd be like start end, start end, but not going like this. It's more like this. Ah. Hope that makes sense. You know, what? I'm just gonna show you. I'm just gonna show you what it looks like. Ping pong on the beat. All right, take a look at this. Ping, beat, beat. And then if we wanted to do linear, check it out, see? Restarts at the beginning. It's always starts from the beginning. So the behavior that you want can definitely be found in something here. So like I was saying before, Beyond offers custom waveforms. Uh, where you get a graph and you can actually really dial in the movement of your cue. And I love that. That that was something that I really, really needed. Um, so I can get like really precise um, emotions out of certain movements because not everything is like super robotic or like nicely rounded. You need Sometimes you need a little bit more. If we go down here to this section, you can see a slider where we can adjust the amount of time it takes for this action to complete or this action to make one stroke. Um, so we can do change this to two. Now it's gonna take two beats for it to travel and then two beats to travel back because we're using ping pong. See, it's a little slower. Or if we wanted to do this action based on time, uh, we can switch this to a clock. I usually don't do that. If I need to do things that are based on time, I'm not even using clock beat mode, I'm using timeline stretch mode. And then what I'll do is I'll take the event itself and I'll stretch it out to where I need it to complete its action. When you're on timeline stretch mode, this changes right here into repeats. You can use this to influence the amount of times it's going to do the action. So let's switch this to linear. So it says repeats is two. So in the amount of time that this event has to operate, it's going to go across twice. See that right here? It's halfway. That's the end. Yeah, so they both have their uses. Uh, you just gotta find them. There's a bunch of other ones that we can use. This one has to do with colors. I mean, it's obvious, it's it's labeled right there. You can, you can see what it is. Mirror is really important. Usually with lasers, there's a lot of symmetry. Um, in the beginning, you use a lot of symmetry. So if you wanted a, um, a cue to go back and forth, but have another version go like this, now we're mirroring. Right now we're gonna mirror X and see these ones are preset at 30. Maybe you don't like that, just right click go back to zero and now we can go ahead and we don't actually don't need to use any of these options because we have that position x effect going on and 
Here we can take a look, see? It's mirroring without any of the options set. Now, if we didn't have the position X here, we can actually create the same movement. So I'm gonna turn off an effect by clicking on this check mark. Now it's off, now it's on, now it's off. So now we just have mirror X and because there's no movement, it's not really mirroring anything. I mean, it might be brighter because now we're doing two of them, um, but there's nothing happening. Uh, but what we can do to mirror that exact same effect we had before is we were on timeline, right? So we're gonna do start negative 100, finish 100. We have ping pong on, and I think we had repeats at two. So now if we play this, this is the exact same effect that we had before, just created in a different way. And you're gonna find there's a bunch of different ways to create what you want. You just gotta figure out the easiest way for you to design it. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and reset these effects so we have what we had earlier because I want to explain how the order of effects matters a lot. What I mean by that is effects that you have uh, below, certain effects will, damn, ugh, it's kind of confusing. Here, let me just explain, let me just show you. If we have this guy going left and right and we have mirror X underneath it, we have this nice smooth motion. If we had mirror X above position X, so we can change the order of effects by using these arrows right here. If you highlight this guy and then hit this, we're gonna move it above. So now this looks a little different, right? Now we just have one line moving, moving left to right, but why? That's because the original line is first being mirrored, but the original line isn't really doing anything. The original line is just, it's static. So what we're doing here is we're mirroring the original line, then we're applying the position X effect, which basically just moves the original line left to right. And that's why the ordering of your effects is gonna matter. When you start messing with uh, rotations, it gets super complex sometimes. If, if something's not going the way that you think it should be going, try changing the order of your effects. And that might be where your problems lie. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and take that cue that we created earlier and drop it down into this empty effect. So that's one of the cool things that we can do. Um, any cue that you think you're going to reuse or use often, I would recommend creating it and putting it into a timeline. I actually do this myself so I can be a lot faster with my creation because there are some basic shapes that you use all the time. What, what I would recommend doing is figuring out what shapes you use and then just take some time to populate that thing. If you're too lazy to create your own, I have my personal palette, my workspace shape palette that I use for creating my shows on tinydeskgraves.com. All right, so I mentioned this earlier, how you can create effect tracks actually right here. And that is important if you want an effect to span multiple events. Uh, let me show you, let me show you what I mean. So we're going to take track two, right click it, add effect line. We have this effect line. Um, this works the same way as creating events. What I'll do is I will double click and hold, creates this empty effect. I'm gonna span this over multiple cues. Not this one, because this is on a different track. So it doesn't affect this. I'm going to copy this and paste it. If you wanna move the playhead um, and like be able to drag the playhead, you're going to right click and hold and you can drag this now. That is something I didn't know until I started experimenting. So I'm glad you know now. <laughs> what I want to do is make the shape go from like 25 to 100 back to 25. And then that'll be on beat. So we'll do geometric because we have a circle. Um, let's use zoom. That will scale everything, um, X, Y, and Z. Um, so what we're gonna do is we'll go from 25 to 100. And we're gonna do this on beat, ping pong, beat. Good, let's see what this looks like. Uh-huh. So we see that 25 to 100 back and forth. Coming up on the next cue switches and we're carrying on the same effect. 
Um, that was a very simple example. Um, it's also helpful if you're trying to do something where you're moving an object or you're moving a cue and you're doing rotations and you don't want to have to like calculate what angle it's at now based on how many beats have passed. You just want it to work. This will make it just work. Okay, this might be the most important thing that I'm gonna teach you today because it's gonna save you so much time. So I went ahead and filled the timeline with two versions of the same cue. Um, they're separated a little bit just so we can see them. Uh, this track one cue is on top and this track two cue is the bottom. Now they look fairly similar. The only difference that you can see is these bottom ones have a little arrow near the picture. I don't know the exact word for it, but I like to say that these guys are linked. And what I mean by that is if I change one of them, they all change. Okay, so in order to create something that's linked, what you do is first create your queue in the, in the workspace. So create a queue here, new shape, create your shape, hit okay. I'm hit cancel, we already did this. And then take it, drag it, place it. Place it onto your event. Maybe you'll have an empty event or you can have a populated event. Take it, place it, and now it's linked. Now, all of these are linked, including that one that I just created right now. If I right click on this linked event queue, hit edit shape, let's change the color to red. Not only is this one changed, but they're all changed. Here, change. Here's supposed to be a change. And another change. They're all red. They're all red, though. Now, if I do that same thing in these cues, these events, it only is going to affect that cue itself. See, they're both red, right? It's blue. So what you would have to do if you had a bunch of cues that repeat throughout your entire show and you decided, I actually want to make that red now. You have to go throughout your entire show, right click and get in there and change the color, which should be really annoying. Um, so you have to apply a little bit of um, forward thinking to make this, this work out for you in the long run. With these linked events, when the arrow is pointing up like that, that means that this workspace queue is still linked. Like it still has control over all of these cues. What I can do is go into here, edit the shape. And let's make it, let's make it a triangle now. These guys down here will all turn into triangles. Now this only exists when you haven't saved your show yet. So let's go ahead and save the show. And you'll see that these arrows are going to change into just a different arrow. It's gonna be like a downward pointing arrow. Now, uh, what? now we should be able to still edit one of these guys down here. So let's make it a line. And the rest of these should follow. Oh shoot, they don't follow. Dang, that's tough. Okay. Yeah, so Beyond has a bunch of those little things that make creating laser shows a little bit more comfortable. Um, that was that was one of them, and I actually thought you could do that on Quick Show. Um, it's been a while since I've been back on Quick Show to experiment. Yeah, sorry, it's not gonna save you as much time as I thought. All right, the other thing I wanted to talk about was actually prepping the show to be put onto the lasers. What you have here is a great outline, but it's really important to put it out there and see if there's any strobing effects, unintended strobing effects going on, correcting those, because it could definitely ruin the viewing experience. I remember when I was first starting out, I was ready to show my show to everybody and it was pretty choppy. It's not exactly how I imagined it would be. So there's a couple of ways to get around that if you experience that choppiness on the laser. Number one is reduce the point count. If this doesn't work out, just drop this. What's, maybe we'll do drop points. We'll drop it to like 15. That should give you a ton more headroom uh, to work with right there. And now say you have all of these cues too that need to be changed, right? Uh, what you'll do is, so we already changed this guy. Right click, go to queue, copy content shape. I usually like to just put it somewhere here, paste it, right click, paste. 
and then I'll just um, we'll drag so that one's linked 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 uh, this way I can modify one and it will modify all of them so that last thing I talked about is important it actually does help not as much as like it doesn't beyond but it does help if the point count isn't the problem or now that you've reduced the point count and it's just not the same it's not as bright and it doesn't it's not gonna impact the viewer as hard uh, what you got to do is maybe reduce the size um so we already have all these guys links still let's edit shape bring down the size uh, you can use the scroll wheel if you hover over this you can actually use the scroll wheel move it up and down that can make or break your show so definitely do these little tweaks so that the finished product looks amazing that pretty much wraps things up for this beginner tutorial. Now you're aware of a bunch of the tools and intricacies of Quick Show. The next step is figuring out how to get that feeling of music into the movements of your cues. Like I said, I recommend just putting effects in and figuring out what each one does. That way you're mentally building that catalog of effects that you can use to represent yourself. If you need a little bit more inspiration, I do have some of my show files for sale on my store. You can buy them in like a spectator mode where you can just see it on the lasers or you can dive a little bit deeper with the designer edition where you can actually take a look at the timelines that I've built look into the cues and draw inspiration. It gets kind of complicated sometimes, but it's only as complicated as you want to make it. You can make this super simple if you want to. If you found this video useful, I'd really appreciate it if you liked it. And if you want to see more laser content from me, um, subscribe. I put out full length shows and I'm also going to try to do more tutorial based stuff. Thanks so much and good luck on your design journey. You got this.